I should say. Let's get started. <laughs> How are you all feeling this evening or afternoon, wherever you are right now? Awesome. Well, welcome to our breakout session on mental health and healing in the outdoors. I'm Radha. It's like uh, rather with an English accent. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I was the field correspondent in um, Azama in 2019 and the Odin Falls base this last summer. Uh, so I'm a person that deals with mental health issues myself. Um, and so I'm particularly interested in this subject. Um, it's just something that I think a lot of us have to deal with and uh, handle and um, navigate in this life. So I think it's great that we're having this conversation. Um, I'll be your moderator for tonight, uh, but I'd like to introduce you all to Outward Bound, uh, Northwest Outward Bound our mission and our panelists for this evening. So Northwest Outward Bound has been serving the communities of the Pacific Northwest for over 56 years, developing leadership skills, character, integrity, and compassion amongst our students during that time. The goal of every Outward Bound course is for students to discover their fullest potential through experiential learning, manifesting in the form of increased self-confidence, awareness and respect for the interdependence of individuals and a desire to make a positive difference in their own lives and in the lives of others. As a nonprofit, NWABS has served over 1600 students this year alone, impacting thousands of lives in the process. We hope to continue to grow as an organization, integrating equity and inclusion into every aspect of our organizational culture and infrastructure. Operating within outdoor spaces requires the acknowledgement of the land we recreate on and the injustices that have, that have and continue to take place in our course areas. The Portland headquarters is built on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, the bands of Chinook, Tualatin, uh, Kalukoya and Malala, along with many other tribes who lived along the Columbia River. Today, Portland has a large urban Native American population with over 380 federally, federally recognized tribes represented in the Portland metro area. Uh, the Odin Falls Base Camp is located on the ancestral lands of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs comprising the Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute tribes. The Mazama base camp is on the ancestral land of the Inkalapamuk and the Okanagan tribes. So we acknowledge the systemic policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that have, that have and continue to impact many indigenous Native American families. We recognize that we were here, that we are here because this land is occupied and its traditional people, people were displaced by colonists and settlers. As guests on this land, we honor with gratitude both the land itself and the people who have been stewards of the land, both past and present. Uh, so this evening, we are welcoming a really outstanding panel. Um, our speakers come from diverse and acclaimed backgrounds. So if you would like to give them a hand wherever you are, That'd be great. <laughs> um, so our panelists uh, includes, and I'm gonna ask you all to give a brief introduction of yourself, just like a minute or so. Uh, so we have Josh Trujillo, he is an NWABS instructor. We have Brian Reese, who's a PhD at OSU Cascades. Stephanie Lucas, who is a marriage and family therapist and Ami Violanda Adams, who is the Oregon Program Director. Uh, Josh, let's start with you. Hi, yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Josh. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, like Radha said, I am um, an NWABS field instructor and just general outdoor enthusiast. Um, I was really excited to be asked to speak on this panel because 
um, nature and mental health has been something that's been uh, really personal in my life growing up. And I'm really grateful for the um, impact and perspective I get to have um, and be a part of for the students' lives um, as I'm on these courses. So really happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Ryan. Hey there. Uh, like say, I'm a professor uh, at Oregon State University uh, Cascades campus uh, located in Bend, Oregon. Um, and like Josh, nature has been integral to my own mental health and wellness throughout my life. And I've had the great privilege of um, integrating a lot of nature in my work with clients in outpatient settings, uh, as well as into my research. Um, so I'm very pleased and excited um, to be here and to share the space uh, with everybody this evening. Uh, Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Lucas. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm a family and child family and teen therapist. <laughs> there we go. Um, and I've been doing a lot of work in the community over here in Bend and have been really connecting with just the teens in general and how they're coping with everything going on uh, in the world and how they can utilize the outdoors uh, or maybe need to utilize the outdoors in order to kind of grow and heal. And so I'm really excited to be here and talk about how that's going to be possible here through your program and in the future. All right, Ami. Hi, everyone. My name is Ami Adams. I am the director of and WABS is Oregon Wilderness Programs, um, and I'm located in Redmond, which is right near Bend, if you're unfamiliar. I um, have had the privilege of working with students in many different capacities throughout my professional life um, as an instructor, a teacher, um, and a learning specialist prior to taking this job at NWABS. Um, and so I've some insight around teenagers um, <laughs> for the last decade, but also um, the impacts of the pandemic on uh, teenagers, which have been vast. And I'm excited to be here. All right, thank you all. I'd like to also introduce Kristen. Uh, she is in charge of ops at our Portland office. Uh, and I will let her uh, take it away. She's going to be doing the technical aspect of tonight. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen. I will be moderating the chat throughout our session this evening. And at the end of our panel discussion, we will open up a space to, for our panelists to answer your questions. So please feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat and I will be keeping track of those. And also, um, if you aren't familiar with Zoom, you can change the view. Uh, you should hopefully be able to see all our panelists, but you can change the view in the top right corner to do gallery or maybe even extend your window. I hope everyone has a good discussion. Awesome, thanks, Kristen. Uh, so yeah, finally, I just wanna thank all of y'all for being here. Uh, just really excited to have this conversation with y'all. Um, if y'all want to, I'd love to see a little bit about uh, in the chat, if you just wanna drop in a real quick shout out for where you're uh, joining us from, that'd be really cool. Um, just hit the drop down, make sure you're messaging everyone, that'd be really cool, love to see that. All right, so let's get started with our first question. How about that? Oops, forgot this part. All right, so we're talking about the health benefits. Uh, so what are the mental health benefits of spending time in the outdoors? Uh, and this is a question, oops, sorry. Uh, let's see, this is a question for, uh, for all of y'all. Um, really, but I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit from y'all about what, um, what makes the outdoors just different than, than any other type of space. Hey, 
Maybe Ryan, let's start with you. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and I can, I can probably talk too much on this topic. But I think I, I like to think about it more from like a personal place first um, with how this idea of non-human nature or natural settings like has been, I think I just, it's had such a profound influence on my own health and wellness in terms of just being the place that has unconditional acceptance of me uh, is, is how I often feel within natural spaces. It doesn't mean that it'll necessarily take care of me, <laughs> um, uh, but, but I'm able to be me. Uh, I, I'm able to experience my identities and to experience non-judgment uh, within a natural setting. I'm able to experience a sense of getting away, a sense of relaxation and calm. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's simply profound and it has been profound throughout my development as I've, I've worked through and overcome my own uh, challenges in my life. Um, and, and the research is, is just absolutely compelling. Um, back in the 80s uh, and, and really working into the 90s, um, looking at the effects of observing natural landscapes in lab settings or experimental settings, um, uh, it has now demonstrated for like 30 plus years, uh, maybe going on 40 at this point, um, just profound influences on the nervous system. So activating parasympathetic nervous system or rest and digest response and deactivating sympathetic nervous system response. Um, again, time and time again in experimental settings has shown this. Uh, and also um, looking at just focus and concentration, some really interesting studies in the early 2000s, moving into the teens, looking at uh, children and ADHD symptomology. And for children um, presenting with ADHD symptomology, following exposure over across a, a certain period of time, um, the less severe the, AD, the uh, ADHD symptomology. Um, so those are just kind of a few examples. I mean, I, I could, again, talk all day about the, the mental health benefits, but those are some, some really significant ones, um, just in terms of reducing stress, enhancing focus and concentration. Um, and as we know, if we, can, if we can reduce stress overall, that's going to contribute um, positively in terms of our mental health and wellness overall. But certainly I'll let other folks jump in here as well, so. Yeah, feel free to, to jump in to all of these. Maybe Stephanie, I'll ask you, what have you been seeing with some of the work that you do? Yeah, I was just gonna hop on and say that a lot of what we talk about, I mean, everyone has heard the word mindfulness, right? Um, and a lot of what is going on, especially with the teens and young adults is, but I think older adults too, is that our world has become smaller and smaller as we can't go out and go to class or go to weddings or go to all of concerts for all of these events where we feel like community and we can kind of feel each other's energy. And so being outdoors has really become a resource even more than it was. And it's a very rich sensory experience to be able to practice that mindfulness and say, I can go and I can be in community with myself right? I can be in community with nature and I can notice where I'm at and not be thinking about, oh, I've got homework due in four hours or, you know, how am I going to get home? My car's going to break down or whatever. Um, I can just be where I am. And it's really giving you that opportunity to practice that skill, which has been really hard and getting harder, I think, for uh, our poor youth who are scattered and, and struggling just to maintain all of their stressors right now, for sure. Yeah, uh, a follow up to that, you were mentioning community with nature, um, as well as community with people. And I was wondering, how would you maybe describe community with nature? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I think being community with nature is about being humbled a little bit that we when we live in our world and you know, we can close the door and keep out the wind and keep out the squirrels and, and, and feel safe, but also being in community with nature, recognizing you are equal, but you're not better than any of the, the pieces of the elements that you're in. And so like owning your own worth and saying, I'm here, I'm valuable, just as valuable as every piece of this, but I'm not better than any of it as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Totally. How about... I'm your Josh, like I know with our, um, our bound courses, a lot of 
what we would call uh, solo time can be just that, the mindful piece of it. Um, what would what would y'all say you've seen um, in being able to to do those kinds of things in course? Um, yeah, I can speak to that for a bit. I think because of the pandemic going into the solo experience this summer, um, we've kind of even framed it differently, right? Like everyone's had their fair share of isolation and time alone. And so I know I wanted to be really um, kind of sensitive, you know, to any, any really uncomfortable traumatic feelings people might have um, for that. And I know a lot of students going into it voice like that was either what they were looking forward to the most or what they were most worried about. Um, kind of depending on that, the student's experience that they brought with them from, from COVID. And so I think trying to promote that as like a, a different type of reflection in mindfulness and kind of um, really explain that this can be a very different experience, right, than sitting um, in your room at home, which is like just, to, um, Stephanie, you're talking about like the sensory, right, experience of maybe being inside or like in a more developed area and then you're just out in the middle of the woods. Um, I think easier to maintain that mindfulness and it allows uh, a lot more reflection for the students um, as they've processed all these events coming onto this course. So um, kind of reframing it as like a really positive uh, but still like solitary experience was um, really important I found this season. I can just um, tack on a little bit and like, absolutely yes to everything everybody else said. Um, and my, my background is in science, so I uh, always look to research in these scenarios. And something that I've been thinking about recently is the, um, the feedback loop that teenagers are constantly in right now um, with, I mean, even just having phones. Um, and the removal of that when they're outside, whether it be on a course or um, at the point in the course when solo is happening. And I think the importance of that, like the importance of removal from um, constant distraction and, and uh, feedback, not necessarily the way that we do it at Outward Bound, more the like checking to make sure that you are um, properly presenting yourself type feedback that is, can be super damaging. Um, and so I've definitely noticed that teenagers, I would say throughout the last five years or so have um, entered wilderness courses uh, more stressed than before. And usually the first one to five to maybe 10 days <laughs> is challenging. Um, but pushing through whatever that um, limit is for most students ends up being a largely positive experience um, and one that hopefully sets them up to um, remove themselves from that type of feedback loop when they're not outside removed from, you know, their friends, technology, et cetera. Awesome. Well, uh, let's move on to the next one. I, I want to kind of bring this a little bit more um, to y'all uh, individually. I wanted to know what has been, um, what has nature made you resilient and work through challenges? Oh, I didn't word that right. How has nature, <laughs> nature made you res resilient and work through the challenges of life? I'll take a turn going first. <laughs> um, I know just most recently, probably, I mean, I could tell a hundred stories, right? But when the pandemic started, I have at that point, a one-year-old and a four-year-old at home with no childcare and was juggling, you know, 20 hours of clients a week and then going home immediately to take care of them. 
uh, going on walks and running was the thing that I did to stay sane every day, even though I was staying in my own neighborhood, like getting that fresh air, connecting to the sunshine and like grounding myself on. And I was taking my kids with me half the time, right? But just saying like, this is something that I can do for me. This is something that's good for me. It's not about losing weight. It's not about, you know, hitting a goal. It's about being here and being present and doing for myself every single day, kept me sane and kept me like, I could see the difference every single day. So I think that just having, knowing that's right outside the door is so validating and reassuring and definitely something that's been impactful for me. Yeah, and I feel like all of y'all live in places that have access, has, has pretty good access uh, to that. I was wondering, um, yeah, what, what about, uh, the rest of y'all, what what is um, healing for you, and and has has given you resiliency? Um, I can I can go next. Um, just as I've really grown to um, find find more ways to enjoy the natural world, whether it's through like adventure sports or going hiking or. Um, things like that. Um, I feel like naturally I've developed goals and I tend to be like a pretty goal oriented person. And um, it's been great practice and great like feedback when I've been able to accomplish something that I thought was going to be challenging for me. Or and, and even if it was, right, I can think back of all the lessons I've learned along the way. And I find myself when I'm facing um, some challenging situations that don't really have to do with these, you know, contrived things I've come up with myself in nature, like, like real life, like having to um, kind of make choices of what I'm going to spend my time doing, you know, in this really difficult year, I've, I've kind of thought back to that goal setting, that goal attainment. Um, and that's given me a perspective of like, I have the skills to do this, like I can, you know, work through this incrementally. And um, so I think, I think like tuning into my, my perspective that I've gained through my time outdoors has really helped me. Um, yeah think about just my everyday front country life so can you think of an example specifically that has really transferred over um yeah so I'm thinking of um the first time I would like I really wanted to learn how to lead uh in rock climbing with like trad gear. So I'm like placing my own protection in the wall. And it's like, um, you know, you really have to trust yourself and your skill in the rock and this equipment. And it can be a pretty unfamiliar um, kind of experience. And I think learning to trust myself that I'm skilled enough to like, um, you know, I'm responsible for my own safety, putting this gear in the wall. And so I think that's giving, you know, just for example, like, that really lets me know that I can um, um, kind of push through some fear and some doubt that I have about my skills and um, have a little more like self-efficacy when I, um, yeah, look to kind of um, push through stuff. Like right now I'm in class, you know, and I'm just like, wow, like I can set these goals and um, feel like I have the ability to do things. That's awesome. I love that. For me, um, it's, I find that my time in nature has been spent um, getting centered and feeling like I'm part of something bigger. Um, I really believe in the idea of establishing sense of place and kind of understanding where you are in the grand scheme of things. Um, and I grew up um, near the ocean on the East Coast and um, have always lived around water, luckily. Uh, and I think for me, being in water is a very calming thing, um, which is not the same for most people. I think a lot of people are really freaked out by water, but um, which I understand. But for me, it's like if I'm having a really hard day um, and I don't always remember to, to like, hey, the river is literally right there. I can go jump in. 
but um, it really changes my perspective. It really changes my mood if I can get myself in water anywhere. Um, and I think that, that that has made me resilient in my work life. And again, luckily I've always lived around water, but. Uh, I really appreciate what others have shared. I, I kind of want to take a different spin on, on the question a little bit, um, not because I'm avoiding how it's impacted my individual life. I think that, you know, nature has certainly contributed to a great deal of re uh, resiliency for me. And I've worked through a lot of, especially earlier in development, I, uh, lots of depression and anxiety um, and I, I, nature has always been my, my space and it's contributed a lot um, to my resiliency, I think, in my, in my growth. But when, as I was reflecting, when others were sharing, like, I think what really emerged for me was, I almost want to say, I think fearlessness is maybe a little bit too strong of a word, but most of my sessions with my clients in my practice are outdoors. And what I've appreciated about meeting with my clients in the natural environment, including park settings, has been when I give voice to a question or I reflect something, it hangs out in the space and it's there. And there's no need for the client to respond quickly. So there's lots of space. And it's made me over the years, over the past 10 years or so, it's made me much more confident and assured about bringing things up sooner with clients when there's tension within the dynamic and or there's, you know, there are things that are going on with, with the client that, um, you know, it's kind of scary to bring up. It can be vulnerable to bring up difficult conversations with clients. Um, I find that I, I, I feel much more confident and I feel much more resilient in asking some of those questions and being that presence for the folks that I'm working with. And I find that to be true with the individuals that I work with as well. Granted, I get a lot of folks in my practice who don't want to go to counseling, <laughs> you know, like they're no, but I'll go see this dude with a man bun, like, and go walk the river trail. Sure. Um, <laughs> and and so I, I think I too have learned from their courageousness and their ability to show up and to just give it a shot. So anyway, slightly different take on the question, but I, but I wanted to share that because I think that that's what was present for me. Sure, that's really cool. I think that that also um, brings a level of, uh, I think it's important for us to, be vulnerable and how, you know, nature allows us and being outside allows us that space. I think it's really cool. I think it's really important. Um, thanks y'all. Um, well, I wanna get a little bit into what Outward Bound does. Um, and I wanted to ask this. Um, so how do you think instructors have dealt with the the level of mental illness that has occurred through this pandemic? Um, yeah, I can speak a little bit about that. Um, compassion has always been, I think, one of the most important values that Outward Bound has held as an organization. And um, it's just the value that I choose to lead with, um, dealing with students that um, I can't always know right exactly what experiences they're bringing with them and I'd hope to talk to them and understand um, but ultimately I just need to be the most compassionate person I can be to create um, an emotionally safe environment um, with the rest of the group um, and I think the real progress gets made as soon as that has been established um, in my experience and that's what primarily my focus is in the first few days of course is um, role modeling, right? Role modeling that compassion, the empathy, um, setting the bar high for how I would like the students to treat each other. And um, through that, you know, you can reach that emotionally safe environment to then really have bigger conversations that the students um, are really bought into and enjoy discussing, so. I 
I think it's been a really difficult year for many instructors. Um, and I, I think we, you know, and we'll kind of get into this later, but um, we really need to address how we are going to support students moving forward because I, I don't think that anxiety and depression and other mental health concerns are going away. Um, and that can really take a toll on, on instructors to be um, kind of managing that and mitigating that on courses throughout the entire time um, or to have students go home because they're having such a hard time with their mental health um, and just the, the emotional impact that that has on instructors as well as the group. Um, I think that this is something that um, has again been increasing and is sped up by the pandemic um, and that we now have to work to address um, and currently our instructors do go through mental health first aid training. Um, and we also talk about, um, we do student management training, which does include um, emotional and mental health. However, um, I think we can do better and will continue to um, add on to those trainings in coming seasons because we have to um, and we want instructors to feel like they have the tools to support themselves when, when uh, supporting others in the field. And, um, you know, there are other considerations from kind of the administrative level around, like, what do we need to look at our courses and how we're running them? And do we, you know, need to slow things down? Do we need to um, do something differently, et cetera? Yeah, uh, and you know, as you were talking about that, I was just thinking, um, you know, the dynamics of the group, um, in how does how does that affect the instructors as well, and and what are we doing for instructors going through those situations? Um, yeah, I mean, group dynamics are a huge part of any outward bound course, and. Um, I think one of the hardest parts of this job is that you'll never have the same group twice, right? It's, it's um, a completely unique kind of social environment. And um, I know I've definitely, when I've had my biggest struggles, I've had trouble, um, you know, attributing certain aspects of this, uh, the kind of the group dynamics onto like what I'm doing. Right. And, and I think, it's appropriate to be like, okay, to what extent, you know, can I really impact this in a positive way? And um, I think sometimes it's really easy to internalize some of the stuff that maybe doesn't really have to do with uh, what you've chosen to do as an instructor. And that can be, um, I think one of the more difficult parts of um, dealing with group dynamics, especially with the increase of mental um, health incidents that we've seen. So yeah, just um, definitely wanted to share like, some of the things that I struggle with out in course and um, kind of separating myself from the group environment is something I'm always learning how to do better. I think yeah, kind of, of, ooh, oh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> no, you go ahead. <laughs> um, I was just gonna say, I think something that we as an administrative team at NWABS um, need to lean into next year is when instructors have come off course and potentially had a really difficult time um, with students um, and supporting their mental health, I think we need to ask, like, can you go back in the field on your next course? Are you sure? Because um, I think part of it is, uh, you, yeah, you don't have the same group twice. You also usually have about five days in between and are kind of like, rolling right into the next course. And um, the nature of the work is that you don't have that much processing time and then you crash at the end of the season. <laughs> um, but that's not setting people up for a sustainable lifestyle, especially as they have to put in more and more emotional 
input um, each year. I feel like there's so much on this topic that I would love to discuss more. Um, but I think with the time that we have, let's <laughs> move on to a different question. Um, this one, this, there's so much to talk about on this one. Um, but um, I guess I kind of asked this a little bit with the resiliency question, um, but I want to bring it back uh, to y'all again real quick, to personal experiences. Um, just tell me real quick something that was a really special trip to you um, and, you know, a, an outdoors trip that, that really just really helped clear your mind, heal you, um, and do all those wonderful things that nature can do. Yeah, I can, I can go first on this one. Um, one of the reasons I was really excited to be on this panel is because uh, when I was in high school, I had the privilege of going to a wilderness therapy program um, when I was really struggling uh, with depression and anxiety and just being a teenager. I don't know. It's, it's, it's rough. So uh, I was grateful that I was able to um, kind of really explore the wilderness around Utah. And um, that was the first time that um, I was taught, like, I feel like, you know, looking back as an hour bound instructor, like just the fundamental interpersonal skills that I teach students every course, you know, like that was my first exposure um, where someone like really challenged me to be vulnerable, you know, and open up to a group of strangers and um, kind of put all out there and, and I guess lean in is a phrase that we like to say. And I had no choice but to, to lean into that discomfort and that entire experience. And um, yeah, has been the thing that really has motivated me to uh, become an Outward Bound instructor and work in outdoor education and, and work with youth. It's just my way of paying it forward. So, yeah. I don't mind jumping in. Uh, for me, I'm recalling, so during my undergrad, years I was a fly fishing guide up in Alaska and I can recall one summer where the uh, and so the guys we would live on kind of the side of a, a river in tents for uh, a couple of weeks at a time and just kind of move from river to river well the guests would stay at the main at a main lodge and they would fly out each day so we had a week of really heavy rain in mid-August and um it flooded the river. And so we kept having to move our uh, tents back. And we were camped out on, on the tributary of the main river that we'd go out and fish for salmon, but we'd fish this tributary quite a bit for Arctic char, rainbow trout, that kind of stuff. And we were, we've all, we always wondered like, I wonder how far up we can go like up this river, like, because during typical flows, the, like you couldn't get up very, like more than like two or three miles. So, with the flooding, we thought, well, hey, like this was like a cool, it's like, let's, let's go, like we don't have guests, like nobody's coming out. So like, let's go see how far we can get. And we went and uh, there, there's, I think two or three things in existence that I'm really good at. One of them is washing dishes when I'm at my in-laws house. The second thing <laughs> I think I'm really good at is driving a jet boat. Uh, and then I'm okay at counseling. But man, I'm really good at driving a jet boat and washing dishes at my in-laws. So anyway, so like we made it all the way up this river. For like it was like a three hour trek. And then we came around a river bend and there were, it was a waterfall. We had no idea that what was at the top of this river. And there was, it's about an eight or nine foot drop. Got out of the boat, checked it out. There's all these silver salmon, like jumping the falls and stuff. And like, it was just this epic experience. And so that to me just jumps out as just this awe inspiring confidence boosting. Wow. Like, look at this. And then, and then also the camaraderie, you know, between, you know, with the, with the fellow guide who I was with. So anyway, I'd like to share that story. Wow. That's beautiful. I can go. Ryan inspired me. Oh. <laughs> um. I wasn't actually going to talk about all of my family members camping, 
Um, and I was like, I know that's not just one moment, but it was so like so much of my family bonding was out camping, learning to fish and watching my mom be scared of bears and all of these things. And then listening to Ryan made me flash on this moment um, when I was in Spain. Um, and it was such a foreign environment to be in Barcelona, which is a big city, right? Bustling city and to be a continent away from anyone else I knew. Um, and they took us out on this hike about three weeks into a 12 week program. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, this is home, right? I felt home again out in the Pyrenees. Um, and it was just such a, a beautiful emotional moment to be like so dysregulated for so long and so uncomfortable for so long. And then to just walk back into nature and be like, there it is. Like that's home, that's where home has always been. Um, so I just, it just made me think of that really like imagining <laughs> all of those other experiences. I love that. I'm having a hard time picking something. Um, and I think that for me, um, it's, I don't know that any of my like more immersive epic trips have been my best experiences outdoors. I think um, it's usually when I am fascinated by something and fully immersed in that. So whether that's like tide pooling um, on the coast or um, I also have experiences just like going up a river to see what's there and that kind of deal. Um, I think that's where, so I have many. Yeah. Um. Ryan, your story reminded me of, I'm a total nerd, of Lord of the Rings, where they're going down the river, and there's that huge waterfall, and, like, there's the, uh, the stone uh, statues, and I'm just, like, imagining this, like, epic thing, and then, like, you know, Ami talking about the water, and, you know, Stephanie talking about the mountains, and Josh, you talking about, like, this epic experience in the deserts, like, just all these different places in, you know, the world that are just incredible and, and how much space there is for us to um, get out there, you know. Um, you know, and talking about these experiences, I, this question isn't one that I've given you before, but I was just thinking about something, Stephanie, you said earlier about like being able to step outside your door and be out in nature. Um, and I wanted to ask a follow-up to that, actually. I don't know why I didn't ask this earlier, but um, what kind of, what would you say to someone who doesn't live somewhere where they could just step out the door and feel like they were in nature? Like, for example, I live in the suburbs and I have, you know, a concrete sidewalk and a road, <laughs> you know, like, how would you how would you suggest to someone to be able to get out in nature? Me too. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I live in, in definitely the neighborhoods. I mean, I could run probably about two miles and get out to a field, right? But um, that's, I think, the beauty of mindfulness is that you are in nature. You just, it's just small, right? But you can look down and find a bug on the on the sidewalk and watch how it's walking. And you can look at the blades of grass and the tiny little strip of, of grass and, and be looking at just the biodiversity of that, right? Or the way the leaves, even the leaf outside of Panera, right? <laughs> it's changing color, like it's there and it's it's waiting for you. You just have to tune into it. Thank you. The clouds are always there for you, especially in Portland. <laughs> mm, that's good, yeah. I have a couple of trees in the backyard. Sometimes I see squirrels. <laughs> That's good. Um, let's go to the next question here. So I uh, wanted to talk to um, 
Ami and Josh specifically on this one. Um, so what do we think, what do y'all think we could do next year um, based on what, um, you know, what we've seen this year? Josh, what do you think? Um, yeah, so I think I found a lot of, um, I was able to work, you know, a couple of courses this summer, and I feel like I learned along the way, right, of um, dealing with a student population that's coming in with um, more, um, yeah, just like mental health concerns, and um, it really comes came down to um, framing. I think framing is really important, right? Before every experience um, that we facilitate, um, I want it to be framed to the point where like the students kind of, you know, they, they have an idea of what they're getting into. Maybe they're already thinking about um, and paying attention to what kind of like challenges they can face or, or um, different aspect to like literally every single thing um, that we, we do on the course. And so, um, it really helped me in my framing to be authentic about, um, I think mental health and share a little bit about what I think some of the benefits of being out here, um, and kind of, um, yeah, just like right away with the students, um, cause that allows them to, I think, I think embrace it a little more, be a little more curious and, and have, um, I guess kind of kind of sell it on them, right? Like this is an incredible experience that um, I think a lot of a lot of kids, right? They don't get that disconnection from the phones or or just being um, in in really structured environments all the time. And so, yeah, kind of framing this course as an opportunity to um, detach from a lot of that and um, share a lot of my experience. I hopefully in like a very um, thoughtful a uh, way to, I don't know, I guess just inspire. That's that's what I um, found success in like adapting my style through the season and um, what I'm really hoping to bring in um, next season to hopefully welcome those students that have that anxiety and those concerns about um, being out on course, so. Um, on the programmatic oversight side, I think um, this is something that we've been thinking about, you know, for the entirety of the season. And um, I think it starts with providing instructors with more support and more training um, and administrators with that as well, because we have to answer the phone, you know, like we have to be the ones who sometimes ultimately make the calls on students staying on course or not and um, the level of support that we can provide given the situation and so um, that's something that we are planning for and as I had said um, earlier I think something that we need to lean into is making sure our instructors are okay to go back in the field because it emotional output is exhausting and um, having that level of emotional output if you do have a course where many students are really struggling um, and then the the physical output as well of being a field instructor and then um, having to roll into another course is hard and unsustainable and really doesn't set up our instructors to be in a good place mentally and emotionally. Um, and so those are kind of the two big things that we are planning for and thinking about in the administrative team here. Yeah. And I want to bring this to Stephanie too, um, and maybe Ryan. Um, what kinds of, um, you know, training could be built into that, um, built into you know, next coming year um, and kind of like, if you were to be training 
an instructor to go back out and handle some of these things, um, how would you go about doing that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. It's really harkening me back to, I've worked in three different residential treatment facilities um, for drugs and alcohol and mental health for kids and teens. And so all of the skills necessary for those really high, really intense moments, right? And so I think there are a few really grounding principles that are really important in order to be able to cope with those. Um, one is just your confidence level. If you have education on what a panic attack looks like, how to de-escalate it, how to walk a kid through that, um, you can walk into a situation a little bit more confident and say, we can handle this, it's gonna be okay. And actually it's much more effective than being like, I don't know what to do. We're supposed to be getting on the boat. Like you can't just get on the boat, like what? And then everybody's kind of picking up that energy, right? Whereas if you can stay in that confident, I know how to handle this position, um, you can very quickly kind of de-escalate that pervasive energy because you're, you're in that leadership position of we can all handle this together. Um, the second, and I don't know if your program, it sounds like you don't work in teams, um, but the team was very, very important for us when we were working in residential treatment or to be able to go and debrief and be like, when that happened, like, what was that, right? Or say like, gosh, it just pushed this button for me, it reminded me of my sister or whatever it was, like to have another human being be able to witness that and have a safe space for that and be there for that after a moment and know that it's there is so important. Um, because like Ami was saying, we can't carry it all. We can't just kind of walk off the field and have only been the only one to really have experienced what we experience when it's that intense and then just keep going. Um, we need debriefs and that's true in the medical field as well um, that I see a lot of clients who are in the medical field and the mental health field and just having somebody else to witness um, those experiences for us can be really important and I think what Josh said was my was my other thought was that having a very clear expectation of if you're struggling here's what we're going to do right here's who you go to, here's what you say, here's where we're gonna support you and to know it at the output and for everybody to know it at the output can be so grounding and reassuring of, um, you know, we're gonna check in every single day at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. about where you're at on your mental health and it can be as simple as zero to 10, it can be as, as long as a 20 minute conversation, right? But to know that that structure and expectation is there for everybody so that if somebody's struggling, they don't sit thinking, and they're not sitting there thinking like, what am I supposed to do? Who am I supposed to tell? Who do I trust? Right. And then in Josh speaking to that, it really establishing that trust is so important. Yeah. And I remember just when I'm out there, um, I'm always really uh, thankful to have my co-instructor out with me, at least one and we're on the river even more. And so, um, yeah, I think that's an essential part of my mental health and well-being. Um, just like you're saying, 70 is like have someone there to witness all these things and to bounce ideas off of. And I very much find myself like debriefing every night before going to bed, you know, with my co's to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I think something that I'm really hoping to implement more um, with my the co-instructor teams um, is like mental health plan, you know, like how can we team up and best support students that we've said, you know, seen have these have similar patterns, right, of behavior, similar um, things like depression, anxiety that they're bringing into courses and um, cause we, we talk about that, you know, in our pre-trip stuff of just like our plan for, um, almost everything. And I want to just highlight that like mental health, um, bit and, you know, have a kind of a unified plan come into this group. Um, I think it's just going to set me and mine, you know, my co-instructors up for success. So that's definitely a big change that I'm hoping to do next year and like really utilize, utilize that co-instructor as a resource. So. Oh, that happened. Okay, so this question is for uh, Ryan a little bit, um, if he could elaborate for us. So um, how can the momentum of a positive NWABS experience be sustained upon re-entry? And I was wondering if you could elaborate on what you mean by re-entry. I think I have an idea um, a bit about that, but I'd love to hear that in your words. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, 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 um, I work a lot with adolescents coming out of wilderness therapy programs. And so this is something that comes up often within wilderness, um, where 
adolescents or young, or young adults are, are out there in the setting for a week or weeks or months on end. And then there is this transition period, you know, and it is a, it's a it's a long transition period and it's a it can be a really difficult transition period. Um, and so this reentry idea is whatever that next place that this person is, re, re, is re, uh, returning to. And so when I think about momentum, I think that that like momentum uh, around whether it's relationships, momentum around uh, nature connection, um, momentum around uh, therapeutic growth or learnings or, or self-awareness that individuals are coming into. So I think that can be really broadly defined. Um, so I, I, I guess for me, like I, th this has been an important, I guess, question that I've, I've been asking when working with wilderness programs, as far as like, what is the plan for reentry? Like, what, like what, what have been the primary points of growth for this individual? What is the plan that's in place upon this reentry? Um, and so it's, it's maybe a bit more intense than, than, um, than what might happen in outward bound, I don't know, um, in terms of kind of that aftercare process. But I guess two pieces really come to my mind about the, the um, uh, adolescents who may be going to outward bound. For uh, I imagine for many folks coming in, this is uh, quite the exposing and or vulnerable experience where it's like, they're coming in and they're like, all right, like, what if people see me? Like, like, I don't want people to see me, you know, like, so whether it's hiding personality, not talking, acting out in different ways, you know, to really kind of cover up who this person really uniquely is, but slowly over time, maybe that chips away. So then the vulnerable self can come out for a lot of individuals, maybe not for everyone. And so when that happens, like potentially for the first time for some of these folks, they're experiencing a sense of authentic, genuine community. And so I wonder, and I hope, you know, that, or I guess I wonder about how can that momentum around community be sustained um, upon re-entry into one's home environment or home neighborhood, even if they're not finding it within the family system, within the immediate neighborhood, where the spaces or places within the home community that the individual might be able to be put in touch with to continue working on developing that community uh, for themselves. Um, I guess to really sustain that. And similarly, kind of with this like nature connection or wilderness connection that folks may be developing where, you know, they're heading out for the first time from like into, into a wilderness setting for many of the individuals, I imagine, and experiencing and learning you know, about and watching, you know, the instructors and like, what does nature connection even look like or mean? And then they're seeing it, they're experiencing it. How might that be sustained for them wherever the home environment might be? So I guess that's something that I, um, that I've seen just be really important in my work with clients. And again, oftentimes coming out of wilderness programs, but um, it, it, it's uh, something that, that, uh, that I love talking about that point of reentry. Yeah, I wonder if um, one of y'all could speak to that a little bit and, and how you may finish out a course and um, talk to students about going back home. Yeah, um, I've definitely found that that transition to home life to be one of the most stressful parts of course for students, right? They've, they've seen um, how much of a change, right? This, this program can make in their lives. And they're definitely nervous. They're like, how do I apply all this to my my everyday life, I go back and you know, they're worried about slipping into old habits or just, you know, um, and so um, kind of, I, was, I, was, I was talking about framing for a lot of these lessons, but um, I think closure on the other end of all these experiences. Um, throughout course, I try to bring up the idea of transference, right? And this is something that the, the outward bound model is like fundamentally based upon, right? Where students have these experiences they're able to like pull out like kind of the abstract, like big picture things that they're learning from these uh, wilderness experiences, nature experiences, and slowly start to like 
figure out how they can incorporate that into their lives. And that's a lot of the coaching that I try to do um, at the end of the course, right? Is like, okay, like, tell, you know, they kind of start expressing how grateful they are, how much they've learned. And it's like, okay, how can you keep that moving forward? And um, we have lessons on goal setting, you know, and lessons on self-care. And, um, and I think those, I try to stress that these lessons don't just apply to being on course right here, you know, and this is something that I'm teaching you so that you can take into your everyday life. And so having that conversation and like really, um, really making sure that the students understand that these skills transfer. Right. And, um, I think serve to calm some of that, that unknown, you know, like what, what's life going to look like back there. And so, um, I found it helpful to brainstorm that with students, you know, and empower them to come up with these goals. And um, I think I've noticed that they're um, a lot more excited than to face home, right? You know, because they, they feel more empowered to make this change and they have a plan. Um, just like those treatment plans, right? Coming out of the wilderness therapy, that's that's something I had to do. And um, while our, you know, the plan here is isn't is, looks very different, similar ideas, right? It's like, what is this going to look like when I get home? How can I make the change keep going? Yeah, I think we say that the real hour bound course starts when you get home, right? That's that's when the test uh, really begins. Wow, that's good. That's really good. Um, well, I have only one more question left for y'all, um, but I want to remind our audience, um, our panelists would love to answer questions from y'all. So if you would type in your questions there, um, and um, we would love to hear them. So I have my last question. Uh, this is a very practical one. Uh, what are some tips on how to enjoy nature in our everyday lives? Uh, and I think, um, I think Stephanie, you already touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to hear from all of y'all uh, about, um, yeah, other tips that you might have that you have done in your own life or, you know, expressed to students, expressed to clients. Um, yeah, love to hear that. I can keep talking. <laughs> um, I use a lot of nature imagery um, in my office in, and even in when I'm talking with clients. Uh, I practice EMDR, I know Ryan does too. And we talk about, um, I talk about riding the river of your memories and your experiences. And, and a lot of that is about trusting your own brain and trusting your own memory network and saying you don't have to fight like this you know, this is what you're supposed to do. This is how therapy is supposed to work. This is how you're supposed to. So I use a lot of na natural nature-based metaphors. Um, I have one couple who we always talk about how the wife really likes to rip the tree out and expect all the roots to make sure that the marriage is still lasting. And the husband's like, well, if it's the tree falls over, probably dead. Right. And so like, we use a lot of these metaphors of like how things exist in nature and how uh, we can use those things to understand ourselves and our relationships. And I think that, that people really ground with that. And then they have that image going forward to be able to like get back to and remember those things that they learned. Um, I'm going to answer a question that's in the chat at the same time as I answer this. I think at least part of it. Um, I think that people often feel like they need to have wilderness in order to, um, continue their experience. And I think one of the really important things that we do at Outward Bound is that transference piece and the fact that really our courses aren't focused on like doing epic things outside. They are to an extent, but it's, it's really about personal development. And um, I think that something that our instructors already do, something that parents can do and family and friends can do to support um, is like listening to 
the stories and the experience and allowing the student to share some of that with them in whatever way, like whether that's like sitting outside on the porch or whether that's like, hey, I know how to do this thing and you all should go for a hike with me. Um, or like talking about leadership styles and like identifying who in the family has what leadership style. Um, those kinds of things that um, not only allow more depth and to create community within a family or within a friend group or whatever, but also um, empower that that student to keep their experience going. It should translate, you know, to home and when someday they decide to go back into the wilderness. Uh, while on course, um, you know, we have the big solo experience, but leading up to that, um, it's important to like kind of expose students to shorter periods of time of, of just like reflection and nature without the rest of the group and come kind of just mini solos. And I think, um, you know, it, it, for a big solo, it's, it's really a privilege to be able to put aside all your obligations and technology and everything for, you know, maybe even an entire day. But I think mini solos are a great way to um, immerse yourself in, in any kind of natural environment that you have at home. And I think part of that's a mindset of just finding, right, finding how, how nature does exist in, in maybe the suburbs or, or something. And, and just, you know, like going for a walk without your phone for an hour or things like that and bring a journal, you know, think about, um, what you've learned since your course or, or think, you know, and help, uh, I don't know, kind, kind of make that solo experience, um, part of your, part of your week every week. Part of my work, uh, or I'd say most of my work in the research realm, but also as applied to my clinical practice has been asking this question of how can contextual affiliations with nature be a benefit to one's immediate wellness. So contextual affiliation, meaning within one's lived everyday context and experience, because not everyone is going to have access or that desire to get, get out there, wherever that out there you know, is. And, and so that also becomes a diversity, equity, inclusion you know, issue as well around social justice, um, certainly. Um, so I don't want to overlook that with this comment or these comments I'm about to make, but in looking at how does the individual that I work with define nature? How do I define nature? And how can I really flex that definition in a way of, of seeing this idea of natural environment being on a continuum? So something that Stephanie mentioned and, and several folks is really just, just expanding this notion of, of what nature is and how I might be able to experience and or be in community with that. When I think about spending time in nature with my kids, if I try to go on a hike with my kids right now, developmentally, I, we make it like a quarter of a mile max because they're so curious. They're, everything is just sort of just like new to them every time we go to a place. And so I just, that childlike wonderment makes me wonder like, gosh, like, man, imagine if I could apply that, that notion of mindfulness where it's like, I'm seeing it as though I'm seeing it for the first time. And if I'm able to access that ability, how much can I benefit from that in my everyday nearby kinds of experiences right outside my window? So like right outside of here, I have this tree and like, you know, like the leaves are always shifting and changing. And so like just to slow down and to notice that even if it's, even if it's for a moment. Um, and I guess the other piece I, I do want to mention, I, I just feel moved to kind of say that like, like how do I not only enjoy nature for myself, but how can I contribute to others' nature experiences when I'm out in a common outdoor space? A, a, an area of literature that is quite fascinating to me is around that um, exposure to natural settings can actually facilitate a sense of community and a sense of connection with others. Um, it can actually cause us to feel a little bit more caring about other people. But I think that we actually need to be open to this uh, this possibility and, and kind of this mindset or framework. Um, so that's something that more and more I'm thinking about when I'm going out as far as what are other people's experiences that they're having and how can I, you know, not, 
not like get in their way to like make myself feel important and then be like sit to try to see like oh how's your day going on the trail but but more of just how can i help everyone feel welcome on the trail so i had one last really quick tip that i just thought of um I actually am very intentional in my social media to go out and follow accounts that emphasize spending time in nature, because if I'm taking my most dissociative behavior, which is being on social media and reminding myself intentionally, there's a world out there. It's really beautiful. You could be out taking that picture, right? And like being very intentional about those things, I think, especially with the teenagers, like training their brains to put it in front of them and not just be kind of sucked into this world of dance videos, but recognizing like you can go out and be very intentional about who you follow and that you can put that in front of yourself and remind yourself of how important that is as well. I think that's an awesome point. I was actually gonna ask um, about that, um, about how important is it if we can't, if we aren't able to uh, easily go into nature, like say it's, you know, 70 mile an hour winds outside and you can't go outside, um, but you need that mindful space, how beneficial is it to be, you know, looking at a picture of nature or watching a video about, you know, someone mountain biking or something like that? Like how, you know, what, what are some of the effects of doing just that? So the question is, what are the effects of what, uh, like what, like watching the nature like, videos, like like, like yeah, Planet yeah. Earth or yeah, totally. You know. So so I'm really intrigued by kind of technological nature and some of the literature and research around techno nature, and some literature really suggests that technological nature is better than no nature, but not as good as the real thing when it comes to effects on the nervous system and um, how it affects our, 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 um, our ability to focus and concentrate. But it's really fascinating. Um, there, uh, there's some really fun literature on virtual reality environments. So immersing oneself within kind of a 3D space of nature images uh, with auditory sounds. So like waterfall sounds, rain sounds, ocean waves, and just how that can have such a similar effect as though the individual is actually experiencing in, in where they are at, um, or, um, or, or I guess experiencing as though they are really there. Um, so uh, from what I'm familiar with, like it, it's, it's really, um, can be really effective. And so that's something that um, I have a lot of psychoeducation with my clients on is around like, these are possible resourcing techniques and strategies that you can utilize um, when you're at home and not outdoors. Yeah, nice. Uh, I wanna read this comment from uh, Russell in the chat. Um, so he says, building on whatever mental health first aid response um, training that field staff are getting in uh, is having some underlying framework, understanding of emotional regulation, dysregulation, uh, and recognize the program isn't therapy, but definitely therapeutic. So uh, what baseline understanding is there in building that with the response to, specific, to the specifics that Stephanie was sharing earlier? Um, so I think, um, I think he's asking that the program isn't therapy, but, it, but being outside in nature is therapeutic. So, you know, how do, how do you build that baseline? Um, I think maybe you can comment on that for me. Maybe, maybe let me rephrase. Um, uh, that he was referring to when y'all were talking about changes for next year uh, on building a uh, first aid response um, that field staff are getting trained in.
I think I can, I can try to answer this. Um, so I would say many of our staff already have that understanding and whether that's from personal experience um, related to them or somebody that they know um, or just growing up in a time when anxiety has become more prevalent and more talked about. Um, and I think that the thing that I am recognizing as a need um, that kind of falls into this question is um, when to, how to respond and when to recognize that it's too much, that you are spending too much time and um, output um, providing support to a specific student um, or multiple within a group. And I think that that, that really is the boundary between um, therapeutic programming and nature as therapy outdoors. Um, and I think that's also something that we are like paying attention to and adapting because of the prevalence of um, anxiety and depression and other mental health challenges that many of our students have coming onto course. Um, and in numbers that we did not used to see. Um, I remember when I first started as a field instructor, we would have maybe one student with diagnosed anxiety, and that's like maybe one. Um, and as the years have gone on, that has increased substantially to the point where it's, it's pretty much a norm to have about five, like half the group has diagnosed anxiety or something. Um, and I personally have also worked as a wilderness therapy instructor. Um, so I have a little bit of a concept of like, this is what that kind of programming looks like versus what we are doing. Um, and I think there are some really incredible resources when looking at wilderness therapy programming to provide our instructors. Um, and I think also the reality is that we need to lean into that and use some of that because um, like I said earlier, anxiety is not going to go away. Um, and so part of this is like adapting where that line is um, for our instructors and um, just recognizing that our programming doesn't look the same as it used to, and it's not going to. I think that's a really good point, Ami. And I think in thinking about the instructors and what they need, um, when we think about becoming a therapist, they tell you, you know, you're only as good of a therapist as much you've been in therapy, right? You know about yourself and you have learned about your own history and experiences in the family. And I think that that is probably true of instructors too, that the more seasoned instructors have been out there and, and run into themselves a few times. Uh, and so they know kind of what can come up or what's difficult for them. Uh, but also there's this vibe sometimes in the mental health world where it's like, well, get out there and figure it out or burn out, right? And how can we instead on the front end support instructors and say, we don't want you to burn out. We want you to figure out how your family experiences may be informed. You know, are you going to have tough love with this student or are you going to encourage them and be compassionate and, and what's going to be your baseline and how can you grow that and really supporting um, instructors on the front end and back end so they don't burn out and they don't feel like they have that. They're just stretched too far and they'll have the resources that they need. Yeah, and I think an, another consideration is like, within the like, how are you going to respond aspect? Um, is this gonna be really triggering to you? And like, what kind of students are going to be really triggering to you and how are you going to deal with that? Um, and is that an area where you're gonna to need to call and get some support or 
um, you know, depending on the severity of the response, like is that maybe a scenario where you can't stay in the field, um, which is unlikely, but definitely possible. And so I think providing those tools to people as well is really important, having those conversations. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm really glad that we're having this conversation. Um, but we are just about out of time, um, unfortunately. Uh, I knew this time would go by pretty quickly, but there's so many other things to talk about. Um, do, you, do any of y'all have any uh, final tips or things that you would like our audience to go away with? There's a lot more little, little nature moments you can have throughout your week in a seemingly very unwild place that we find ourselves spending most of our time in I'll say I think um I've even had my moments where I, I like I'm like I feel so far away from where I really want to be in the middle of a forest somewhere and um and then stepping back from that and like then I realize it's like wow I, I should just go out of my way to sit under a tree you know and and look at some ants or something right you know and stay curious um yeah it's it I've always been able to find my connection to nature in almost any environment I am, right? And, and that kind of releases the floodgates and makes me think about all those times I've, I've spent in wilderness or, you know, some of the most serene places I've ever been. And like that, that connection is never severed. You just have to look for it sometimes. And, and yeah, and so I, I challenge everyone to um, go out and find those, those little nature moments. I do want to say something that is um, a little bit contradictory to what we have been talking about, but I think important to be said, um, while being in nature is really important for mental health, for some people, it is not good. <laughs> it is, it creates a really huge challenge and um, may make anxiety or other things that somebody is experiencing much worse because it's it feels like an unsafe environment um, for whatever reason. And so I think that um, outward bound courses or and similar are not necessarily the answer um, to students uh, experiencing mental health challenges. And um, it's just, that's an important thing to think about as I'm like, okay, don't all just send your kids on outward bound courses right now, whoever is watching this. Um, I think it's, it's really important to think that through and um, vet that beforehand. Thanks for that, Ami. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, for everyone, you know, being in, you have to be in a certain headspace, I think, to maybe accept, accept it. Um, and yeah, you're right. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's a challenging one to navigate. Um, my suggestion would be to see a therapist and talk to your therapist. <laughs> I know there's something I really think of, just kind of along those lines of NWABs maybe not being for everybody or a wilderness immersion experience. You know, I think about the the term uh, nature worldview. I have my own nature worldview. I have my own lived experiences with what nature contact and connection means for me. And it doesn't mean that it's going to mean that same thing for somebody else. And in fact, I don't know anybody else who has my unique nature worldview because I'm the only me that I'm aware of. Um, at least at the moment, I think I'm the only me. So uh, that's just a good thing to really kind of remember, you know, it's ever, I mean, before ever taking a client outdoors, before ever integrating eco wellness into my work with clients, I assess for their connection with nature. I talk about it with them and get a good sense about, and also before ever going outdoors, I assess for physical safety, past traumas in and around natural environments. Um, all of that is just so pivotal. And it's not to say that we don't ever go out, like for some clients, the social anxiety is too intense and or just 
the past traumas are too intense around even going outdoors um, for any number of different reasons. But you know, at some point, maybe we work to that point or, or, or work to that place. So I really appreciate that, um, uh, what you just shared there, Ami. I think in a similar vein, um, and I was talking with Rob a little bit before this and thinking about what has changed in pandemic life in terms of the challenges that the outdoors offers. And I think when we think of an outdoor challenge course, we think of pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone. We think about challenging the unexpected and challenging um, our ideas of what's safe and what can I handle. And gosh, if we had some extra opportunities to face those challenges. And so I think that that might be what we're seeing, right? With those kids who are hitting that limit of like, I do not need one more thing that I don't know what to expect, right? Like, no, thank you. And really recognizing like, there's plenty of other things to be found in nature in terms of like peace and connection with yourself and acceptance that we also really need right now. Um, but that there is that spectrum of like, how much out of control can you actually handle and how much is the growth edge and how much is too much for sure. Oh, thank you all. Thank you all so much for that. Um, our panelists have so graciously offered their emails um, for you to connect with them. Um, I apologize for the little marks on there. I don't know what I did and I don't know how to get rid of them. So I apologize for that. <laughs> but here are their emails. Um, please, if you have any other questions, contact them. They would love to chat with you more about this. Um, and it's a passion for them. And I know it's very important uh, to all of us to be able to, to have these conversations. Um, Yes, yeah, so just thank you all uh, panelists for being here and taking your time out to do this. This is just, just amazing. Um, and I thank you all for joining us to, um, to hear our discussion and, and have this little chat. Um, yeah, we, we need nature. It is healing for us. Um, it's a place where we can connect in community, um, you know, an outward bound course may not be for everyone, but, you know, being, being connected in some way, I think can be very healing for a lot of people and, um, mental health in general is just very important for all of us to be aware of, be mindful of, and, you know, practice, practice those mindful techniques, uh, just so, so important. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, following this, we have a happy hour. Uh, and I think Kristen has that link for you. Um, should be pretty fun. So there's going to be different groups uh, getting together for that. I think there's going to be groups for alumni, uh, groups for instructors, groups for those of you who are just learning about NWOBs and, and all kinds of cool things. So uh, hope you all get to go check that out. Um, thank you again so much for this. We, we truly enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you everyone. Radha, are we supposed to stay? Oops. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Kristen, do you want to follow up a little bit? <laughs> do you want to stop screen sharing? Yes. Yeah. I wanted to make sure everyone got the emails, so. Mm -hmm. We still have a few folks here.